Evening, everyone. I, I'm just going to say a few words. I, I, so I'm Andrew Chitty, for those who don't know me. I am Challenge Director at UKRI. Um, I'm Challenge Director of a thing called Audience of the Future, um, which we started in 2018. And the idea of Audience of the Future was to explore innovation, not in immersive technologies, but in the application of immersive technologies within the creative sector. So making new creative and audience experiences, um, exploring technological development uh, in production, uh, and also exploration of business models. Um, and I guess I get to say a few words at the start of this, because uh, one of our great ideas was the Story Futures Academy, uh, out of funding it out of, out of Audience of the Future. But before saying that, I think I, I just want to say, the, we made a couple of, we did some different things from the way UKRI, so UKRI is our national um, research and innovation agency. Um, so, so it has people. It has people like the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council who fund uh, fundamental research in computer science, thinking of our area. It has the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which supports particularly uh, relevant to this um, R and D and research in in design uh, and in performance. Um, and it also has Innovate UK, which supports innovation in business. And what we did with the Challenge Program was was something new, which was to try and bring programs together, time-limited programs, to achieve actual real-world objectives by bringing all the different bits of the train together. And, and one of those is Audience of the Future. Um, and so one of the other things that we did was we tried to do this by bringing together a few big demonstrator projects. So we did a lot of collaborative R&D where businesses and researchers and groups of businesses came together to look at, um, look at innovation challenges. Uh, but we also did it with a few big um, demonstrator programs. So one of those was the, some of you may have seen, the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company, Punch Trunk, Philharmonia, everybody you've ever met from the performance sector, Epic, Intel, um, did the thing called Dream in the summer. So it was interesting because it used a volume like the one you've just seen, but it did it live. And it, instead of driving a photorealistic image out into the world, which you could view across the internet, it was driving graphical characters, generated avatars, generated in a completely virtual world, and 12 of them at a time. So it's probably large scale. So that's the kind of R&D that you can see might lead to a new form of workflow in theatre, which is similar to the workflows that everybody's exploring uh, in the screen sector. I, I, this is by way of a little advert. Our fourth and final demonstrator, which was about visitor experience, which, as you can imagine, took a bit of a knock during COVID because it was really hard to open a museum's experiences when the museums were closed. Um, actually is now in final, is, is kind of in test performance at the moment. So if anybody would like to see Lost Origin, where you will see dinosaurs, you won't see robots for those of us who know it was once called Dinosaurs and Robots, so it's just dinosaurs, but dinosaurs in Hoxton. So um, if anybody would like to come and see Lost Origin, it's a weird mix of an escape room, a piece of immersive theater, and some of the most advanced mixed reality uh, that you'll have seen, or won't have seen, probably, of this kind. Uh, so it's, it's running now, but we're going to do a preview night on 17th of November, if anybody here would like to come. Uh, invites probably going out in some of your inboxes in the next couple of days, I hope. Um, so we did all those things, but the great, the, one of the great things we did was Story Futures Academies, which, uh, Story Futures Academy, which I think doing uh, what we thought of as a skills intervention, I think... Um, the Academy's been much more than a skills intervention. I couldn't be happier that that's the case in many ways because I think what it's done by shining a light on essentially the skills stresses, uh, whether that's of experienced professionals needing to understand how to use this stuff, whether it's about uh, placements within companies, some experimental productions that are going on, whether it's report like, reports like this, I think what Story Futures Academy has done brilliantly, and the team have done brilliantly, is shine a light on the very pointy edge of the transition that we're going through, or the sector's going through, from what we, what probably used people, you know, a long time ago thought was very sophisticated digital production, but now we just call production, and now we've got this scary future which is virtual production, which in 10 years' time we will also just call production. So I think. It's been, an, uh, and, and this report is a brilliant example of 
Um, just as the, 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 there was a report on business models of companies trying to navigate this that you published recently, it's shining the light on what's happening during this transition is incredibly useful for feeding back to the rest of the industry what other people are doing and trying also to formulate kind of policy or interventions or things like that. So I, I'm delighted. What a brilliant, uh, brilliant report. I'm going to hand over to James and then we'll cascade down the line to actually find out what it's all about. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andrew, uh, and um, thanks to Ben and Alistair for having us. Um, it's really great to, to be here, um, uh, and thank you all for coming out. So I'm conscious that I really stand between you and the real meat of what we're going to talk about, which is the actual skills report itself and a really fascinating panel. So I'll, I'll keep my remarks really brief. Um, we're, this is our second skills report um, Story Future Academy have done. Um, in 2020, um, just before the pandemic, we did, a, we did a kind of skills report that was much more focused on the use of XR technologies in making XR experiences, so virtual reality, augmented reality, etc. And during the, the time in between, we've been really excited to see um, the virtual production opportunity emerge as something where we've seen massive appetite within the creative industries to learn about these skills. We've seen massive appetite within the creative industries to work with these technologies in a way that takes some of the opportunities that we'd seen possible via XR technologies and putting them into different makers' kinds of hands, but also different kind of audience experiences. And with the potential to take the kind of thinking, the creativity, um, and the storytelling genius that we have in the UK to, uh, I'm not going to say mainstream, because the games industry is already massively mainstream, but to new audiences and to mass audiences in a new way. And that's been a massively exciting thing for us to look into in this skills report. Because fundamentally, what Story Futures Academy is about is putting that innovation opportunity into the hands of the most creative minds that are out there in the UK today, but also in the future, and developing that skills pipeline. So we're really about making sure that these technologies turn into compelling experiences and in the process create new jobs, new skills, new products and services, and ultimately growth for the UK to continue being a world leader um, in the creative industries and in great storytelling. So this innovation opportunity uh, is one that's massively exciting with that background in mind, and we're really pleased that the report in, its, in itself has used some really innovative models and methods, um, thanks uh, largely to, to Dr. Claude Heath, who's used a fabulous methodology of combining anthropology, studying people, and using design to understand that this is a problem, a challenge, and an opportunity of people and people where people meet computers and where people and computers meet each other in new ways. Um, it's a whole new world. And the mandala diagram that you've got in your hands and that Claude and Peter are going to talk through um, uh, over the next uh, a short while gives us that really clear sense of what's changing in a really succinct fashion because it is a whole new world. And it's a world in which the boundaries of the previous world are dissolving, changing, interacting. And that's the exciting point, it's the challenging point, it's the opportunity point. But speaking of somebody who's worked in this space for pretty much all my career, looking at where digital innovation hits kind of existing media industries, I think it's the most exciting moment because it's the one where each industry sees its opportunity most clearly. Whereas interactive or digital technologies in the past, different parts kind of like collide and push against each other and I don't understand what the opportunity is. Here, Film, television, games understand what each can benefit from each other, and we just have to facilitate that conversation, we have to facilitate that communication, and drive it forward into the opportunity where each, other, each of those disciplines can push each other forward to drive the innovation form forward. And that's the opportunity for skills, that's the opportunity for growth, um, because this is a really new way of thinking about how we make things, and the, the end products are going to be super exciting. So, I hope you find the report as enjoyable and valuable um, to read as we did to write. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Claude Heath to introduce these findings uh, and set the conversation up. Thanks, Claude. Thank Thanks, Jane. Thanks, James. That's a very succinct... How to follow that? That's a, that's a very succinct overview of, of the space. In fact, James threw down the gauntlet about 
beginning of the summer and said, let's, let's shine that light, uh, as Andrew was saying, let's shine that light and onto the VP uh, production world and just see how much detail we can, we can gather and find out about what's happening on the ground uh, to, to understand these, these new types of workflows and to understand how people are trying to adapt to them. Uh, so let me just show you the methodology first because uh, this will contextualize everything we're talking about. Uh, first of all, we, we conducted about 25 interviews over that period. We, uh, it was semi structured. We, we chatted to people to try to find out what was their, their take on the workflow, where they see themselves within the VP world, um, and to understand the, the workarounds and the interesting uh, new habits that they're beginning to develop. Uh, we um, got about two people from each discipline as a minimum. So we're trying to get a coverage that will be a good sort of foundation for work that we'd like to do following on from this. Uh, and we, we then segmented everything we'd heard, this sort of uh, corpus of data into these different categories here. Discipline, um, department, the role and the skills we've mentioned before. But also, you know, more importantly, the things that they have to deal with every day, pain points, uh, educational background of someone. You know, we've heard from two technicians tonight. It'd be interesting to know uh, what their backgrounds are. I know that one of them comes from, is it Kinga, from theatre. So that's an interesting transition she's made. Um, training, challenges and opportunities. So those are some of the broad themes we've been looking at. Um, and just to mention finally that we took about six interviews from Fireworks, which is one of our sort of in-depth ca case studies that we conducted. Uh, which is a short film which was made, I think, at the end of last year or beginning of this. Uh, and the, the crew from that were very kind enough to sort of talk to us in, in depth about what they, their experiences on that film. So, yeah, I apologize for the brightness of that slide. It's, it's very white, isn't it? But uh, it, it comes from the, the, it's a detail from the report. You'll find on page eight and nine of the report, the mandala. Uh, this is the key to it. It's um, a way to, as I said, to break down this corpus of data that we have. We're dividing and thinking about roles in terms of those people who handle data directly and it goes into the final end product, uh, and those people who um, do not, people who maybe have a creative input. It's a, it's a way to, to very uh, crudely divide and, and break things down a bit. Um, the middle section there, you see the technical artists, those have an interesting blend of the two types of skills, creative and technical. Um, and they are the unicorns, if you like, that, that was the phrase that was being used. But I, I believe that they, um, they, are, you know, they are coming to the fore because of VP now. Um, and then below you see the, the skills that they, were, that they will be using. Um, just to walk you through the development, we started as I, in the interviews uh, showing them the Unreal diagram here on the left, which is the cycle of VP, according to Unreal. And it's, uh, it shows you the cyclical nature of things. It's a non-linear process. Um, and I asked people where they saw themselves within that. And beginning to, to make a patchwork of their perceptions of where they, how they fit into that. Uh, and as you, as you can see, as it moves across to the right, it gets more defined. It gets more detailed. So as things are mentioned, they go into the picture, not uh, in, in a literal sense like, you know, they mention something and it goes in, but it's as a way to just, it's a sense-making exercise. Uh, and then we've also got on the far right some examples of uh, job descriptions uh, that, for these roles that are in the mandala. So we can sort of begin to get a very some detailed picture and drill down into what these roles are and what they're doing. Um, the mandala looks like this at present which is in the report. Um, concentric circles, the, 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 the outermost layer now is the, is the skills that are, that are pertaining to those roles. And the roles are sort of clustered according to the department. They, um, the roles and the skills are not equally uh, def so defined as in you can connect one skill with only one role, because at the moment, as you've heard, the workflows are still stabilizing. It's, uh, it's still a question of finding out which roles are going to be doing what and, and in which company. So let me just um, take you through uh, this video. Uh, this will show you uh, the more, more about how the cycle works and, uh, and the traditional process of uh, the, the linear process is not apparent here because there's a lot of crossing back and forth that's going on. 
it starts up here with the scriptwriter and uh, producer and, and director. This is from the fireworks case study. Forming the idea for the project. Uh, bringing into this early creative conversation the production designer here, Jamie Lapsley, who then has to interface with the virtual department, the virtual um, the VP department, which is this whole collection of very specialized uh, uh, of specialists, uh, who then now, as the work nears towards production uh, readiness, will then start to talk to the, the camera department down here at the bottom with the uh, director of photography, uh, and then the on-set visual effects guys who are um, as you can see here in all these yellow, this mass of yellow, these are all individual um, technical skills that have been mentioned in the interviews. So we're beginning to piece them together and to put some structure into this now. Um, and the net collective effect of this is this collaborative space that's been mentioned before. It's this script, this story that's in the center that holds everything together and that provides uh, the focal point for this creative effort. Um, the as you zoom out, you can see now, that, I mean, I'm reminded of, of a quote from someone who used to work in dailies at, at Pinewood, who said that, that their process there was a very um, uh, dynamic uh, process whereby everyone would dip into a set of skills and tools and techniques as needed to get the job done within the time. And there's a similar effect, I think, going on with VP, whereby everyone is um, uh, helping each other in a sense, and it's a very, it's a very collective effort. Um, but going back to our case study, this is fireworks. So we, um, it, just to explain what you've seen, you know, the background here is what you've seen similarly on an LED screen over on the far side. This is uh, downtown Tripoli, and you have the actors uh, acting in front of that. You, um, I won't go too into too much detail about, about this uh, scene, but essentially the production designer, to highlight a couple of the skills that, that I mentioned before around uh, how you hand over from your design, from your production design to the technical teams and you get that the translation of the initial creative concept to be uh, carried over in a true fashion. And that's, that's one of the skills that um, he, um, he talks about. Uh, skilling up, that's what's required of the technical artist. They're going to be required to work from reference and it actually isn't about making things look nice. It is about uh, making the world true to the story and the characters within that, within that world. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a case of world building. Uh, and that is why the designers, the production designer and the technical artists need to work really hand in hand and get that correct sort of handover of ideas. Um, just to highlight that, here you can see where the production designer needs to take their skill and translate it over to the VP department and get that um, carried over effectively. And everyone works in concert. As you've seen, you've seen the stage, but then when you see the stage in action, uh, it's a collaborative effort. It's very much about that, that melting pot of uh, skills and, and techniques. Another example from our interviews, uh, a film called Percival, where the, again, the LED wall is behind the actress here. Um, the director wanted to get this, he called it the God Ray light, you know, it's that, it's that sort of moment of revelation, it's that moment of um, sort of, uh, he, he has an epiphany moment. And the, set, the scene wasn't doing it for him, so he was uh, umming and ahhing about what to do. Uh, technicians who had set up the wall had not gone to the cafe, he said. They hung around because they're interested. And they suggested taking some panels out of the LED wall, like you've seen over there so that you could put a, a big light, a powerful light, behind the, the LED wall and create uh, the right light effect. So that's, that's what they did. And you can more or less see where that is, but it's not, not really um, disruptive to the effect. Um, so that, that's one of the things I wanted to just highlight, is how that the, um, the way that the individuals that are working in VP are working laterally across uh, boundaries and across disciplines in a way they hadn't been doing before. Uh, and a type of conversation that involves the guys who set up the wall, and it could be also you know, the director and the production designer, and the people who have the technical know-how. So it's about, it's about creating this sort of triangular 
effect of uh, a collaborative conversations that can happen. So we're beginning to use the mandala to map that out, early days. Um, but um, that's as far as we have got with shining our light onto VP. Uh, but there are some highlights and there are some key skills gaps that we want to focus on next. So I'll hand over to Peter, who will give you the run through. Thanks, Bob. Um, so this is really getting into to the, I guess, the, the meat of the report, which is a highlight of the, the gaps that we've, we've found as, as Claude's sort of just flown you through. Um, the methodology, there's a lot of very um, senior people that we, we interviewed for, for this, um, this project. And we broke down, as you can see in the report, not just yet, because I want you to look at this, um, into two particular areas, technical skills and creative and communicative skills. And they're, they're color-coded there on the screen for you. Um, and we also, what I wanted to do was, was focus on some particular insights by way of the quotes from, that, that are included in the report. And I think in terms of technical skills and the gap, as, as John Waddleton there, who's one of the consultants for VP at the Garden Studios, recently opened, um, one challenge is just finding VFX houses that are capable of making real-time assets. There's a short supply of those. So what, what that's relating to is what you actually see on the wall, which you've seen over there, the assets there. They're all created, um, and they're created in the computer. And traditionally, this work has happened later on. People have filmed against green, and then we've to fix it in post, as you're very aware of. Um, it's, this is front-loading um, the work, and in particular, at the moment, I think VFX houses are struggling to actually make sense of what the requirement is in advance of, of production. Um, Matthew Nelson from Space Digital in Manchester, VFX house, and also a production company, tells us the same story, the significant demand for use of virtual production. He's basically getting a lot of calls about it. Uh, directors are interested in it as a medium, as a storytelling technique. And I think a lot of this is about a particular technique for storytelling. Um, and what he says tells us is the shortage of skilled technicians available. He's not finding the people that he needs to, to actually work in, 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 this, in this area at the moment. Again, looking from the technical skills perspective, technical artists, for us, are the most challenging position to fill. Um, Vicky Dobbs-Beck, who's uh, executive in charge of VP Immersive Content Innovation, and Julie Peng, who Claude had a couple of interviews with over the last few months, who are ILMX Lab. Um, Technical artists are a term very well known in, in games, not as well known in visual effects. And so what, what we're seeing at the moment is that um, for, for projects that are, are early starters in, this, in this, this sort of zone, that the production supervisors and technical artists, this is a new, new term even, production supervisors, virtual production supervisors. We're used to visual effects supervisors who are on set actually um, um, working with the director and the team to achieve the, the in-camera effects later. Now, because we're seeing all these effects in camera and it's, it's, it's final pixel, so what we're shooting on the wall there is actually what's going on to, on to the, the, the data. And this is um, what, what we, we did a very quick little flyover of job descriptions and job availability. And what Vicky told us was there's quite a few jobs that they've got that they haven't been able to fill at the moment. I'm sure Sue will be able to fill us in on some more detail later on in the panel. So this leads us to the assets that you see on the wall. And, and again, a challenge for VFX houses, they're not really crewed up for this at the moment. We're hoping that they will. And with the report shining a light, as, as everyone's saying, on, on, on these skills gaps, we're hoping that, that we'll see more VFX houses pulling together real-time teams. And you can see this in the emergence of, of new, new types of companies that specializes in, in pre-visualization, which has been around for quite a long time now, are becoming almost the post houses uh, 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 at the moment. 3D skills for virtual production, very generic term here, and one that, that um, we, we're used to hearing in, in the research phase of this. 
And Paul Franklin, who directed, uh, you may know as uh, one of the creative directors of Double Negative, Paul directed Fireworks, which is one of our in-depth case studies, which we've got a, a clip from coming up. Um, and Paul it, it, um, talks here about asset creation, but particularly for the real-time engine on the wall, because obviously they're used to, well used to creating assets for, for visual effects heavy productions, but, but for visual effects heavy productions that are using these assets in real time on the wall with, with actors interfacing with them, there's, there's, there needs to be some um, uh, new thinking as to how we train people to, to actually work in this, in this area. Um, people need to know how the real time engine works and how the tools will work, because they're very different. It's very different from the traditional visual effects tools that houses are used to working with. And of course, behind all of this is coding and engineering skills. Simon Frame, who's currently working for Netflix and one of their VFX supervisors for many years, um, you need coders. We need people who can get into the Unreal Engine. There's just not enough of them. And most of them are in games, and they don't want to leave. And this, this gives us another problem. People who are working in games are very happy working in games. It's what they wanted to do, it's what they studied to do, and, and that's what they're going to do. So there's not really much opportunity here for us to just say, well, we'll grab a few of those from there, a couple of those from there, and that gives me my crew. Again, this is a training need. We need to actually focus on training people from universities, from, C from, uh, from professional development, to actually fill these gaps. And they're real gaps that are emerging now. And something that, that we've heard from quite a few production designers in particular, there's, there, there's um, Annalise Davis, who produced Fireworks, um, talks of a gap in the market at the moment for technical artists and production designers and stage, stage technicians, people who've got the experience of working on a film set but also understand the game engine and all aspects of virtual production. That's a, a pretty meaty problem that we've got ourselves there. The art department who are used to working with real physical assets that are designed and built and, and manipulated on set are having to turn their hands to designing, building and manipulating assets within the engine. And there's often, as we found with our work with, with Fireworks, the case study, what we saw there is that in the art department in particular, the production designer, Jamie Lapsley, was saying, right, this is my design, this is agreed with my director, and this is how we're moving ahead with it. Here's the real assets that we're needing. So out goes the, the buyer to buy the, the, the right properties, and the virtual art department are briefed the technical artists to design and build the assets for within the engine, and the two need to match. And they're both working to the vision of the production designer. However, what we've found is there's a disjoint there because the um, technical artists are used to being briefed in and using their own creative skills to produce a series of assets that they like, that look cool, that work for them. But when they're having to work in tandem with real assets on sets, props, etc., there's, there's a, often a disjoint there. So production designers are going to have to get up to speed with this because they're going to be required to supervise not just people working on set in real time with real assets but also those that are working with the assets designed and built in advance of production. Technical artist skills in general, so James who's working as a VP technician at Final Pixel tells us that anyone who's able to offer Unreal is definitely a desirable skill to have. And these people who have the technical mindset, but also the creative ability, that's why this is a key role. So, so to him, he's pointing up there to the same thing that Annalise is pointing out, but from a slightly different direction, that, that we do have a problem here, that, that, that the, the skills aren't available for people to skill up right now. So how do we address this? Well, one of the ways Discovery Futures took this on um, in... in um, conjunction with a lot of other people. We had an epic mega grant, thank you very much. Um, Wilder Films, Dimensions, DNEG, Lip Sync, Panavision, and everyone else really pitched in on this. And, and they, we produced um, an, a 13, is it 13 minutes, John? 13 minutes short film that was completely shot and developed for in virtual production. And what, something that James and I were discussing earlier, this, this really is an applied research and development task. It's driving workforce development. You know, how on set have our lives changed because of virtual production? What are the skills we need? 
and how are they manifesting themselves on set on, on a real production in real time. This is an interim report and we therefore have some interim conclusions um, and, and this is what they look like on job training. It's one of the key elements. Professional placements which you'll see personified in, in, in fireworks there. CPD continuing professional development and extension of VFX houses successful academy schemes which would prove very useful. Improvement of on the set understandings of roles and responsibilities that puts it goes to the heart of the communication issues. Uh, communication between departments. How do you get through that? Well, again, continue professional development, test shoots, which de-risk the learning process. If we can set up a test shoot where people can learn on set, they're not going to make mistakes on a real production, but this will really embed those skills deep into the into the um, the process. But there's a lack of common language, which we have discussed. We need to create an open source ontology and a playbook of common VP concepts. Now, we're seeing these emerging now. There's, there's a few of these, these based on case studies of films, and they're going to be really, really valuable. So that, that's, that's our interim findings. And I'm now going to pass over to Fiona Kilkelly, who's going to talk through the opportunities and the challenges that we feel emerge from this. Well done. So, um, brilliant. We're nearly there. Um, before we um, segue onto the panel, I just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight some of the opportunities and challenges that um, we explored in the report with our um, interviewees. Um, clearly, there is potential uh, for... Or let me go back one. Clearly, there's potential for VP to be a hugely transformative within our high-value, high-growth screen sectors. We all know that, but why? Um, virtual production can really be used to enhance our understanding of storytelling and how we work with storytelling form um, beyond the current state of the art and beyond our current kind of use cases, the use cases that we're, we're more familiar with. I mean, there's a general perception that from many of the interviews that we talked to, um, that we've yet to, dis to discover the real kind of power of virtual production as a creative tool in itself within the creative content process. Um, and virtual production creates an opportunity for creatives to have a stronger say in, in, um, in the whole production process, and particularly at the very beginning um, of virtual production projects. And so creatives can really put their stamp and their creative flair um, on the look and feel of a production at the very, very beginning, and actually ensure that those early creative conversations those decisions that they're involved in are perpetuated through the whole production cycle. Um, efficiency is a key driver for virtual production. It's going to make things quicker, faster, uh, and therefore cheaper. Um, Peter talks about using VP in pre -vis, which can reduce uh, reshoot requirements that often run up to 20% of the budget. And um, it can often lead to faster production um, of screen tests, you know, reducing the overall um, time needed to reach um, a, to create a final product. Um, but they can also um, hugely save on production time and costs. Um, travel for crew is minimised, um, as is the cost of filming um, on location. We also look at how creative assets um, um, can be licensed as digital assets to other productions, and virtual sets can be used and reused and repurposed across series and um, serials. Um, and other forms of um, content within other film projects and also indeed within other industries such as the commercial sector. Um, and lastly, virtual production is a really good place um, for people that are trying to break into the sector. We know that the number of VP stages are expanding rapidly. We know there's a huge demand for different forms of content across many platforms. And there's a huge opportunity here for new entrants and graduates and uh, you know, trainees to gain valuable, valuable experience um, on set and VP. But practitioners, and actually um, we were talking to Julie at ILM, really acknowledged that with virtual production, you know, we're building a new ecosystem here from the ground up. And traditionally, ILM's experience of hiring in with an immersive, for example, the, the, the hires have been traditionally, by and large, um, white males. 
but building a new ecosystem in virtual production really allows us to get the foundation of that ecosystem right so it's as diverse and inclusive as possible because those people can fill the gaps that are missing now but also they can help define our three or five or ten year strategy for what VP in the UK looks like going forward. Um, and so then some of the challenges um, that we talked about um, in the report really identified many gaps and pain points in the workflows and pipelines of production talent in the UK. I mean, we all know that demand uh, for talent and training really far outstrips supply. Um, and one example cited in the report is um, there's a clear need for highly creative technical artists who not only can write code, who can problem solve, um, communicate effectively with creators while, you know, while fixing complex technical problems on an LED wall, um, all within a very fast-paced film and TV, highly stressful environment. You know, and shortages, this is just one example, shortages such as these need to be tackled now, um, particularly if the UK is going to make the most of the current opportunity within virtual production and leverage your position as a world-leading um, um, screen sector. Um, and this depends massively on um, developing a rapid skills pipeline. In, in the current market, there, where skills are really super scarce, um, companies talk about a new type of talent retention battle, um, a fear of bra brain drain. You know, as tech companies look to poach, where they would never have poached from before, tech companies are looking to poach from the brightest screen industries, um, and work has been outsourced outside of the UK. Um, so amongst many of the, the technical challenges of virtual production is the real-time integration of set uh, and actors in a virtual scene with, um, virtual, uh, with visual effects. VP fundamentally has a very different uh, time scale to traditional filmmaking. It forces decisions to be made much quicker um, and it really tests relationships on set. So many people we interviewed talk about the importance of providing the space for departments to communicate and understand the skills and technical parameters within which they work and uh, understand new VP processes and workflows. And I think that really speaks to the importance of applied R&D in this space and bringing people on set, giving them the chance to learn practically in a real simulated environment. And lastly, the costing and planning of VP sheets is an area that really needs an awful lot more um, kind of understanding more broadly within the sector. Um, we know that in this fast-paced landscape, we need repeatable, usable, understandable, documented planning processes about workflows. It becomes really crucial if we're going to be able to share intelligence across this space. And also, we all acknowledge that VP currently is prohibitive for the Indies. It's prohibitive for low-budget television productions and low-budget films. So the question here is, what is the impact of that on the sector and what do we need to do right now to address it? Okay, so um, this is, we're almost there. There's, there's some beer and some wine and some food out there. And between you and that is this panel discussion. So. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a very illustrious panel here, and I know in the room as well that there's many people who could equally be sat here, but this is who we've gone for, the top talent team. Um, I'm going to give some introductions. Andrew, who's already introduced himself, but I'm going to give him another introduction, who you know as the Challenge Director at UKRI. Andrew leads the UK government's largest investments into the creative industry, namely the 33 million audience of the future challenge. Thank you, Andrew and the 80 million Creative Industries Cluster Programme. He has over 30 years experience across TV. He founded a multiple BAFTA award-winning agency. He was a ministerial advisor at Ofcom, good luck with that, and founding director of Creative England to, to boot. Here's Lisa Gray, who is currently the v, uh, virtual production executive producer at Mars Volume, recently opened. In August. In August, yeah, hot. She's an award-winning executive producer and content creator who's been pushing creative boundaries and forging new frontiers for 22 years. She has a reputation for facilitating cross-industry collaborations which drive property diversification across new media, so she knows a thing or two about that. Uh, she's now working with Mars Volume as VP producer and she's supporting TV, advertising, music, film, gaming and whatever is new, so quite a big remit there. 
Neil Peplow at the end there is Director of Industry and International Affairs at the BFI, British Film Institute. As a producer, Neil was involved in 18 feature films and TV series. As a director of, he was the Director of Film at Creative Skillset some time ago. He's also responsible for the UK's Film Skills Strategy. From 2015 to 19, he was CEO of the Australian National Film and Broadcast School, and he established the Screen Diversity and Inclusion Network, which looked to address the inequalities in the Australian screen sector. And finally, Sue Lister is executive in charge of everything at ILM Studio in London. She's responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the studio. She oversees all aspects of production. She's a founding member of the studio's leadership team, in fact, and has played a key role in managing its growth and expansion as to where we are today. Prior to this, she won't remember me, but she was head of production at Framestore, and our paths crossed a few times when I was at uh, Studio AKA. And in another life, she was a commercials producer for many years with Purdoms, I think I, re I remember. Great, so that, that's our panel. Um, and they've all been given advance notice of these questions, so they're not, they're, they're some challenging questions here. I'm going to start with you, Andrew. Um, just, just how big do you think VP is going to be? And, and you know, we've seen what the opportunity is represented here with Fiona's slides there, but from, from the UKRI perspective, it, it res how big is, is VP? Well, I think VP is obviously big. I mean, obviously the implications of what the report covers, what we've seen here tonight. This is, you know, the, the current version of what we can view as VP is big. It's big, you know, you've got, you, it's, it's producing skills gap for highly paid engineers in the creative industries. That's, a, that's an interesting thing itself, isn't it? You know, it goes against a whole load of perceptions about our industry. But this is only the start of a bigger transition. So what we th I think what we see is virtual production at the moment isn't, isn't the, full, the full story. So we've got, if you think of virtual production as the, as I say, the pointy end of the convergence of a set of advanced computing technologies around creative processes, then we've got a lot further to go than, than what we've seen at the moment. So it brings in whole areas of AI, uh, machine learning, you know, and for UKRI, so if we're, what we're trying to do, I hope, is try and put in place a kind of R&D support for this sector of the type we've had for the medical and life sciences for the last 50 years, then we've got to think beyond what we can see at the moment. We've got to think out five years, we've got to think out 10 years in terms of what that means. So we've got to think about a whole connected um, series of support from early stage, very experimental, com experimental computer science and kind of artistic and design practice right the way through to near market supporting companies that are doing innovation you know in, in production problem solving at the moment so i think it's i think it's big but i think it's going to get bigger and another dimension to how it's going to get bigger and this has this been touched on a number of times tonight is it brings it, it it almost thinks you think of a set of key tools and platforms for the creative sector um, that are also going to be common to a number of other sectors so I was talking to a company, uh, back, uh, Production Park, well, Tate, who are the stage technology arm of Production Park. I mean, uh, uh, and so when they're looking for graduates to do their game engine work, because they also want people who are engineers, they, so they're not creative technologists, they're kind of create, you know, they're creative engineers. They're competing with Rolls-Royce. You know, they're competing with a bunch of companies for the employment of these people they never have before. Now, at the moment, that's a problem. But in the future, the cross-fertilization of movement of careers between those different industries, I think it makes us, the creative industries, much more connected into other industries. So, yeah, I think that's pretty big, too. Yeah, I mean, it's great to see creative industries being taken seriously by UK research and innovation. And, and you know, the, the analogies you're making there with, with um, Rolls-Royce, etc., it, it's a real... A wake-up call, I think, for government as well to to that they're putting their money in the right place here. This is something yeah, that's going to last. So, so what we've done with audience and 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 the clusters program is just starting that. I mean, that's we haven't had that kind of support before. So the next thing we're trying to do, apart from you know continue those things, that's one discussion with government, but is also trying to set up infrastructure, R and D infrastructure that's, that sits behind that, which we haven't got. So. So one of the ideas that we've got in training at the moment, you know, it's getting to the stage where we'll be talking to Bayes, taking it through Bayes after Christmas, is a thing called CoStar. 
Uh, and there, I think, what we're looking at is something more like the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. It's the kind of things that have been done. And in many ways, I think virtual production is a really interesting term to use because I think the manufacturing sector didn't think that they, they felt that they'd kind of fallen out of fashion. So they invented advanced manufacturing, which is just like manufacturing yeah. now. And I think in terms of virtual production, actually thinking about innovation in, in production, in, 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 you know, in film or screen or whatever, games, it's never been that sexy. But once you say virtual production, then we've got something to, to talk about. And, and maybe that's one of the ways we use this. Great. So, so let's be advanced virtual production then from now on. Well, that's the next. That's come, that's that. Virtual production now, five years advanced virtual production. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. So, so Lisa, just to turn to you here. Um, the op opportunities here for producers have, have been outlined many, many times. The report highlights some real and immediate problems, I think. What, you, what from your perspective as a producer, executive, and working in this space uh, for quite some time, what do you think needs to be done? What actions do we need to take? I mean, we've seen what the report's highlighting here. But from your perspective as a producer, what, 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 what needs to be done? I don't know if you saw me nodding really, really like this when you were going through the report, but communication is a big one. Um, I think a lot of the people that are coming through our studio especially are people that, you know, most people haven't worked in virtual production before and um, the importance of having that education component and also that's I really relate to what the report was saying about the space for all these different um, different uh, departments to talk and talk together and a few of them haven't talked um, ever before and even though we're all speaking English you could we, you couldn't speak any different a language and so lucky for, for, for me I've worked you know I, I have built my own games and I have worked as a documentary director. And, and it's interesting watching some of the conversations happening, but they could be talking very different things. So I think more, most immediately, especially for us, is the, 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 the education and the prep moment. So I liked how you were talking about in the beautiful circle, I'm not gonna give it the credit, the time that you need for prep, especially if it's the first time you've used this, but also the understanding of, of, of working with these sets, even the basics, um, because uh, we, you know, we do quite small scale things at the moment because of our size of our volume, but we're getting a lot of, lot of people in who haven't done it before, is, um, is just, the, um, just, just understanding um, how to approach this. And you know, a lot of the people coming in are saying, oh, this is gonna be definitely a lot more cost effective than going to a location but you know with every every opportunity there's a challenge so it's about being really clear about that but also being patient to walk the path and also us being open that the technology is changing all the time we um we were lucky enough to work with nancy on a project a couple of weeks ago um and there were all these um big players in the industry who were using who were um using the unreal engine and virtual production in that instance for the first time and um, it, was, it was scary, but it was also, it really paid off for the more open-minded creatives um, who were able to take that path. So um, yeah, so that, the, mo yeah, the most immediate are language and also, um, yeah, language and, and, and lack of, lack of um, um, people who can make that, the, the unreal real-time content. That's been a real challenge for us. And directors of photography who are able to comfortably navigate that space. That's interesting you pick up on DOPs there. We did have some quite a lot of feedback from DOPs in the report. Um, we had, a, I think, two, three, didn't we, that we, that we talked to. But they were working in that space, so they're very comfortable with it. Oh, can we have their numbers? <laughs> <laughs> For a small fee. Um, and they, I mean, what do you think... Sorry, Sue, go on. It's a short list on that list of... of DOPs, I think, who are comfortable in the space. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you know, I've, I've talked to a few, some of my personal friends are DOPs, and, and you know, they're, they're interested, they're, they're innovative people, I think, and they're, they're technically, you know, they're technically minded, also creatively driven. And I think, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a training need just there, but, you know, getting to sort of high-end DOPs who are busy on features and saying, give us a bit of training, here's a bit of training, you know, that's one of the challenges for us, I think. Um, but I just wanted to just, Lisa, just quickly pick up on, on what you feel you could do to, to, to sort of um, 
to fill the skills gap. You've pointed at a few of the skills gaps that you've got there, and, and you, are you considering training? And you... We're actively looking at a Mars Academy. Um, we, we see that in um, the jobs coming through and the variety of inquiries is even more than what I listed. <laughs> We're having all very different sectors because media is a is a industry building industry as well so uh, sectors beyond entertainment which is really exciting but we're seeing how much the education component is is really taking up our time so we are you know at the moment crafting different ways that we can do training um, and we also make sure that our staff are keeping up with trends and 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 are comfortable in that space but I think one of the um, phrases you used was really important when you were talking about your DOP friends, is open-mindedness, um, you know, is, is being able to walk into this space and being open to the opportunity of, 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 of learning and um, open to um, something um, being delivered in a way that you haven't, you haven't experienced before, which I think is quite exciting, but it definitely takes a certain personality to be able to, 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 to go into that space. Great, thank you. So, um, Sue? Um, just, just, if you just give us a quick talk us through ILM's approach to virtual production at the moment, would you? Um, so, I mean, I think again, virtual production is huge umbrella term, um, but I think probably uh, our our biggest item in that um, under that umbrella, we have a large volume out at Pinewood on stage four. Um, uh, I want to say it's a circle, but so the dimensions don't really. I think the picture you had up there earlier actually might have, might have it's been, big it been it. And it's screens. Um, it's it's about twenty. It doesn't make sense when I give you three dimensions because it is a circle, but it doesn't quite. It, it's more a sort of oval. Um, but it's about twenty-three meters by twenty-seven, and it's it's seven meters high. Um, it's it's very big. Um, but in addition, so that's a fixed volume. Um, we also have done numerous what we call pop-ups. They are by far pop-ups. They take quite a long time to pop up. Um, uh, but we, um, the difference between them is they're not fixed. So we will build them to a specification. Um, and we've done, uh, we've done three or four of those um, of various sizes um, now we've done um, you know relatively small uh, versions that are uh, you know really just sort of backlight almost um, to ones that have you know moving screens and are really really quite complex um, we've built one out of Le at Leavesden um, we've got another one underway actually at Pinewood at the moment we're running two stages at Pinewood at the moment so, so it's quite busy for you in that space at yeah. the moment yeah um, what, what you, do you have any concerns about servicing all this this requirement at the moment? Yes, yeah, it's it's really I hard. Um, uh, I would say earlier in, if I'm honest, we are just about managing to service two shows at the same time, and we it's lucky that it's a Pinewood because we've got a lot of people running between two stages. Um, but uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a little bit, didn't I just see that guy on stage four? No, it's a, it's a different person. Um, but uh, yes, it is, it's very hard to find the talent um, and, and to st scale up at speed because it's, you know, it, it's actually visual effects is very challenging anyway in, in terms of talent availability at the moment. So even if, you know, one of the conversations we've been having internally is, well, can we cross-train people? But then on the mainstream visual effects side, we're saying, but if you take them off of that and put them onto the stage, we can't actually backfill them either. You know, all of these skills are in very, very high demand at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. So I promised myself I'd say this phrase, Jedi Academy. Um, <laughs> Everything at ILM has is, is, to be is, you know, is, is this a focus for you then? At the moment, you've, it, you've highlighted that need. Yes, it, it, it is. And I think what we're... Really, I think the, um, the massive need is more around the asset creation for us more, more than anything else. Um, and we're... I mean, we're... One of the great things about the asset creation side of things... We're very lucky we have teams all over the world who um, 
and in some ways that works to our benefit because we can have people who are, you know, even when we're in production, we can have people making changes to a load whilst everybody else is asleep. And then they, you know, the changes can get made, turned around in fairly good time. But um, we've actually, we've got two stages in, in, a, in LA. We've got another one um, in, uh, we've had one in, down in Sydney as well. So we're feeding lots of virtual production mouths at the moment. But um, the content creation side of things is we, we are running out of people who can do it even internally. Um, and then we've got to cross train all of them into the um, real time aspect of it. Yeah, this is, this is our big takeaway from yeah. this, this research really, you know, the needs for, for, for skills and training is, is, is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. And um, Neil, um, f from the BFI's perspective, um, wh what's your analysis of this, of this training need? I know you've done, you've been involved in the skills report as well, you've done them in the past. Um, wh what do you think is the short term need that, that you, you've identified? Um, well, luckily, uh, working with our DCMS colleagues, we are undertaking a skills review at the moment to look at exactly this. You know, what do we need? not just next week because we do have a general skills issue because of the high demand that we have in production but what will we need in five years time and how can we plan now to ensure that we don't have severe shortages because we haven't put in place you know the, 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 the development of courses or the development of national occupational standards today so i think there's a there is a longer term pathway that we have to think about um, but in terms of immediately how to address the issues that have been brought up today i think the three conclusions you came to were sensible ones which we should look at how we can kind of boost and amplify post the review. So CPD, like you say, that how do we create spaces where you can safely explore what the communication is, what the processes are, so that you get more directors who are confident in that space. I think that's something which we could look at with um, our delivery partner Screen Skills to see how we could facilitate that. Screen Skills themselves, obviously with DCMS and DIT involvement, are currently developing an approach to uh, naming roles and also looking at the occupational standards which sit behind them. I mean, the, the issue you've got here, which is kind of one we've never had before, is you ha you've got two industries coming together. Games and film and TV have always been separate, and now you've got to get two skill sets to come together and have a shared, a shared language that people can actually understand each other on set and also understand what the needs are and what the demands are and also how to address them. And this is something which we've been looking at for quite a while. How do we create this intersection between games and film and TV and creating spaces where that could have happened? Well, it's now going to have to happen. And how do we create an approach which is just what's happening on set every day where you're prototyping, you're testing, you're analysing and you're refining? How do we do that with things like training and, and national occupational standards where sometimes, well, I remember developing uh, occupational standards for GRIPS. And at that point, they'd been around for 80 years, and it took us three years to develop the standards. And, and I'm sure that by the end of a shoot, you've probably got a new post that you need, or two, people are, two posts have come together into one. Or, so how do we create an open platform which allows us to develop that which in an agile and ad adaptive way, which reflects the way that this technology is moving forward? And I think that's something we could look at through the skills review. How can we create an open source where we all come together as an industry and as, as, uh, and as educators to create what this is, this is, which is applied research and innovation in a way which then has an outcome which is immediate and an impact which is immediate? Yeah, brilliant. And Fiona's pointed out the diversity piece at the centre of, of, of this as an opportunity. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you perceive that, uh, if we can get that diversity gap? Yeah, I mean, I think, and um, Unreal Engine mentioned, uh, Unreal mentioned it earlier today, uh, Unreal Engine is free to access, you know, and I think that is in itself one of the greatest diversity initiatives. If something is open source and free, then suddenly there's no barrier. And I think in Australia, um, Unreal ran a short film competition. So can you use the engine to create uh, a, a clip, which they then gave $50,000 to the winner? They had 1,800 applicants. And, you know, Cassini's Log One, and I recommend you actually watch it, because it's a really good short sci-fi which looks like it was made for you know, 50 million and of those 1800 people you're suddenly looking at okay how many of those can we take into the industry because they've obviously got an interest in games game game coding and narrative uh, storytelling so i think this is a huge it's a huge opportunity and how do we also 
ensure that this idea that you have a right brain and left brain and mathematicians and creativity never, never meet? How do we make sure that that's also tackled? Because I think uh, getting an understanding that you can be a coder and you can be an engineer and you can be creative at, at a, a younger school age is something which we need to do now so that in five to ten years we have the people who understand this job is for me. Well, there's mass agreement. <laughs> I mean, it's good that you mention young, younger people and children in particular because with the rise of coding clubs and things like that, which seems to have sort of been a bit on the wane recently, yeah. one would have thought that would help drive this. Yeah, because I'm just talking from my own experience because I have two daughters, they're 10 and 12, and um, you know, my younger daughter's always on scratch. She gets, she's bored, and she's not being challenged a bit further, and how can we challenge them a bit further, and how can we get them to think, actually, she'd love to make a short film on Unreal. How, can we, how could we embed that in an after-school club? Because I think sometimes if you wait for policy or for processes to catch up with the technology, it's too late. So how can we work with industry through the skills review, through institutions like Royal Holloway and the National Film and TV School, to do it now. Brilliant, thank you. Um, well, I'm a bit conscious of time, and I did want to get the crystal ball out and ask you for some very quick predictions to what the next five years hold. So, as soon as you've got the microphone there, what, what, what's happening? Five years on. Um, I, I saw your questions, and I knew this one was coming. So, I actually asked some colleagues, and I, who are you know much more at the coalface than me. And, um, and really, to a, um, to a person, they all said I, that really the future is probably every set eventually will have an LED, an LED wall. It will just be switched on when it's needed. It will be, it will be mainstream. And I think that's almost certainly true. As, as ubiquitous as green screen yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, I think so. I think, ready? well, you can use it for a green screen. So, Advanced yeah. green screen. Yeah, a grant green screen. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, what have you got for us? Five years? Uh, well, I think some of the problems, the kind of processing, fixing kind of, some of them AI will just take care of. And it won't be AI specifically developed for the, for the creative sector, I think. So the, the bugger is we don't know which ones at the moment. I think that's the, that's the really tricky one. So I think some of the things that look like problems now you will be will muddle through the next three years and then they'll and you know and then we'll get there some of them will be taken care of technology and there will be some that won't be i think the other thing we'll see is a you'd like to think within five years you see a mass democratization but i think that's going to be in itself quite disruptive i think so part of the democratization the rollout of what we think of as vp or or its broader family of things could do very interesting things with uh, virtual humans, you know, so now we're thinking of real humans in front of LED screens, but as you democratize this stuff, I think some of those, young, you know, those younger filmmakers will be talking about using virtual humans, because actually, it turns out actors are quite hard to access, you know. So I think that, so the democratization thing will be disrupted. Brilliant, thank you. Lisa? I think our media language is going to completely change. I think we've had processes and we've had ways of making things that have been a particular way. You know, of course, it's evolved at a certain pace, but I think it's going to be even further disrupted. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what people make in five years. I think it's going to be like nothing we can imagine now. You would hope, wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. I, w I would hope it's something I can't imagine. Yeah, Neil, yeah well, what, I, I do. <laughs> Neil, what can you imagine five years down the line? Um, that we finish the National Occupational Standards for Grips. Uh, <laughs> and the Grips. Uh, for Grips, yeah, for finally we get Grips signed off. Um, now, I, I, what I'd like to see uh, in five years are courses which understand that, you sh and this is something we need to explore through initiatives like this, where does this sit within a film course? You know, how can it be integrated rather than separated and siloed? and that this becomes a natural part of the filmmaking process. So I'd like that to be in five years' time. Brilliant. Sue, you having another go? Well, I, I just actually wanted to pick up on what Neil said. I think that that's so important even now with, with, with film courses. You know, the number of universities that I meet that have decided that visual effects, if, you know, I'm coming from a visual effects company, therefore I should speak to these people. It's like, actually, what about those people? You know, I go and talk about motion capture, but the actor, the acting school don't, cut, get, don't get invited. I go and talk about visual effects, but none of the art school get invited. People, it, people love to live in silos, and this is, this is non-silo world. 
and and actually education really need to start to get on board with with that because we don't exist in a si in a silo as, a, as an in, as an industry. It's something that we need to press home. I think that, uh, that we mustn't keep siloing these things. And, and you know the amount of funding going to science and technology that, that avoids the arts as as part of that 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 joined approach it, it's it's wrong. Uh, I I would also add I. I think that you know the the defunding of the arts is um, is a real problem. They have to come up together because it's all very it's very easy. I think for everybody to think, oh, it's it's all about the technology and the technologists mm. and the engineering. It, always in visual effects, and this is essentially you know there is an element of this is visual effects moving into a different part of the production cycle, main in you know full blooded. But I think that. Always, you know, I've been in visual effects for a long time. The really, t the really challenging pe thing to do is to find creative people and train them in the technology. That's that's the that's the really hard thing to do is finding the creative people. There's a lot of people who work for me who are, you know, we're a sort of spectrum industry, but there's a lot of people who work for me who are very good, strong technologists, but they, they don't know what real looks like, they don't know what good looks like, and that's the hardest thing to train. It's actually much easier to take people who've, who, who are creative, who know how to tell a story, who know what good looks like, and then actually can problem solve to put it onto yeah. a screen, and that's, that's the hard thing, and that comes from an arts education. And that would never be replaced by AI. No. No. I'm going to give last words. I, know, I was going to say there's a great book on that by Kevin Kelly called The Inevitable. If you haven't read it, read it, read it, please do. Um, but he, he, he goes through the explanation. Yeah, he just goes through exactly what Neil said. Um, as a creative person um, who feared technology for a long time because at school I was in the art, I was in the art gang, not in the technology gang. I'm really grateful that in my high school career I was encouraged to learn the tools. And, um, and I, like Sue said, it's, it's, it's sad when I meet creatives that I can see the potential, but they don't, because of what they've been taught, don't feel like they need to cross over. So I think that's where the opportunity of the wonderful creativity we're going to get if more people do that. So, yeah, we're all in a virtual production silo, really, aren't we, together? <laughs> advanced virtual production. <laughs> yeah, yeah, advanced. Okay, great. Well, look, thank you so much, panel. That's been really illuminating. Thank you, everyone, for the great questions.